to the performers. I thought it was great. I saw it on opening night Friday. So, um, and you know, thank you for being part of this talk back. The Hispanic Organization of Latin Actors and Prime Latino Media, uh, a great support of yours and also of the play, uh, rooted for Let's Have a Talk Back. And so here we are, Marco Greco, we have Mr. Herman, uh, Rosie Berrino, and we have John O'Hearn. Um, and so I'm going to start off with the pink elephant in the room, uh, for lack of a better expression. This was written in the 1980s by a businessman um, who was rebelling against the, the Wall Street. Have, have things changed in 35 years, 30, 35 years, you know, I'm putting it out to, and, you know, I'm just putting it out there. It depends on what your philosophy is. <laughs> yeah. On which side you're in, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it was, if it, it, I think it has changed, it's uh, gotten worse. Um, you know, the selfishness and the greed is, uh, is, uh, reached epidemic proportions. Um, and the presidential election is kind of the same discussion, you know, uh, looking at it one way or the other way. So it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's still very rel uh, re relevant. You know, the uh, technique for prying the money out has changed. Mm -hmm. But the desire and the greed to get that money out it has not changed at all. And that's really the Another interesting thing about Jerry Sterner was he he worked uh, for the subways. He collected tokens and wrote plays there for six or seven years. On his tombstone, it says, "Finally, a plot." <laughs> <laughs> um, Marco, I thought you were great as far as people. Then again, I'm biased because I'm from the Bronx, like you. So this is um, like Jerry Sterner. <laughs> like Jerry from the Stern uh, from the Bronx and also Andrea. Um, what I want to say is, this is a revival. It's not only a revival play, but this is also made into a, a feature film with Danny DeVito, who played your character, Gregory Peck, who made $25 million at the box office. Um, how hard, or how did you remove yourself from you know, competing or comparing or following the footsteps of Danny DeVito? I, yeah. I, I think I saw the movie when it came out, but not in the theater. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't pay any attention to it for now. I'm really looking forward to seeing it when it's over. So it wasn't in the back of your head or anything like that? Definitely. Definitely um, not. Definitely not, yeah. No, no, okay, definitely not. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, play, the play's the thing. The play's the thing. Yeah. The play's the thing. Anytime I'm doing a play, I tell myself, the play's the thing. The play's the thing. So then that leads me into, I want to ask each of you of what you tapped into to come up with that. And so, you know, your character was definitely a nerdy, donut-eating, what we would call a weird cutie. Um, how did you create the character in which you nailed, that you nailed? Um, how did you create that character, would you say? It, it was a slow process. It was really finding something new every week. It was, it was really defined through the interaction with the other actors and the process of working together where some days they would try something and see if it worked and listen to what the director said. But as far as like, I didn't know he was gonna be so nerdy or anything like that until a few weeks into it. And really a lot of stuff came out the last few days when we finally got into space. Because I find it odd sitting across from you, and you're like totally different. I'm, I'm very not, I'm not, not that I'm not nerdy <laughs> myself, but like, I'm not a money guy. Like, right, but he's brash. He's yeah. obnoxious, he's nerdy, all rolled in one. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to play. And for you, playing a high-powered uh, Fortune 100 lawyer, who also played the provocateur, mm -hmm. you know, you had to navigate both. Right. Well, how did you tap into that powerful a lawyer when you came out on stage, you certainly commanded that. Oh, uh, well, I'm glad you say that. That was like my <coughs> the biggest hurdle for me was to um, get in touch with being someone who's in command and um, who's very strong and powerful and, you know, ambitious. I mean, I could, I could understand the ambitious part, but um, 
you know, just someone who's in control so much and, and so intelligent. That was the other thing. I don't feel like I'm, I don't think I'm dumb, but I don't think I'm the, like, the most intelligent person. So I just was like intimidated by this type of character to play. Um, and it was I, amazing the facts that she was rolling out when she was in the beginning setting up, we could do this, we could do that. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, how did she learn all that? Let me tell you, it took us a week like of train. Just our first week of rehearsal was all learning about the, the whole financial, financial aspect of this play because we did not understand it. And John, our director, and uh, brought in uh, a friend of his who is a financial business person. What is, what is she? Uh, Mary Ruth is a... Uh the opposite of what the scene is about. Like, I'm talking about anger and so I smile. And it's that, that the going against it, that it, it kind of gets me. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. I think what helps is that mother-daughter, naturally, um, mother-daughter relationships are multi-layered. And when we talked about this a little bit with John, talking about the mother-daughter relationships, how, how difficult and challenging they can be. And I think from one day to another, you can sort of, you can be friends, you can Mother daughter, you can be nemesis, you can be competition. All those, uh, you know, all those layers need to be there. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I relish it really. I mean, I love my job so much that for me, it's really that's just the joy of it. All the levels, no matter how difficult it may be. Yeah. And your individuality, just like her character, she's high powered lawyer, yet this provocateur. Yours is a, a company leader, yet you're also a lover. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, what you got? Yeah, they got 30 million in the bank. <laughs> uh, but also, this, um, he was your lover. He is your lover. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's, a, you know, uh, all, all the relationships are, uh, are uh, found, you know, in the writing, it's woven through the fabric of the, the, the telling of the story, and you know, we 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 had the there's the level of the financial stuff, and then right underneath that, really supporting everything and creating the the major conflict is the the human stuff, uh, um, some psychological, but certainly emotional, and uh, 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 and it all comes into play, and uh, you know, as we came into rehearsal, we began to. Um, know each other uh, by what everyone was bringing along in rehearsal. So, you know, relationships start to play out on stage that you you just never find that, you know, simply by reading it, which no, is, I mean, it's is played, good for us. <laughs> it's so much clearer to me now that yeah. we've had about like five or six run throughs sure. at this point. Sure. Um, just reading it on, on page, just, yeah. So it's not as clear, but it's once you keep going and mm -hmm. back and forth, back and forth, bouncing the dialogue off of each other, you know, that movement, you start to go, oh, oh, okay, I see what this is about. I saw it on Friday, so I had lots of things to do today, and I didn't want to be late, but I came right before the two of you gave your presentation to Stockholm, which really was fun. And so what I want to ask you, when I heard yours, when you presented to the stockholders, the shareholders, um, it, it reminded me of James Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, uh, Spencer Tracy uh, making his courtroom almost like, like lawyers to in, in inherit the win. And so it made me think again of also the political sense we're leaving, fighting for the 1%. I'm sorry, fighting for the 99%. So I'm just wondering, what was that scene that came out so splendidly? How was creating and immersing yourself in that character? Because it made me think of those greats. Yeah, and, and John and I had talked a little bit about the Jimmy Stewart thing. Just the, the all, right at the beginning of working on it, the style of what maybe, I'm, I'm really not a, um, a Certainly not a money guy, and certainly not a, uh, a, 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 a deeply political person, um, but the personal experience is what, uh, you know, this guy was fighting for his life, and uh, um, fighting for the life he believed in, and uh, uh, you kind of let that take over. Um, you find those points of communion where 
because I'm, I'm certainly not like Georgie in any way, shape, or form in my real life, but you know, you find those places where it, it fits. Uh, and um, um, and the writing, if it's if it's in the writing, you're going to end up in that place where it's it's you know he's fighting for his life. It's very passionate. And, uh, uh, they still didn't vote for me. Right. <laughs> but they voted for you. Your impassioned speech. You know, in every courtroom, there's a good guy, a bad guy, and technically, we were going to write you off as the bad guy in that play. However, you gave a very very compelling speech presentation that the shareholders voted for you, and I think the audience did too. And so, I'm, you know, O.J. Simpson had a, a defense lawyer. So every, even the worst person in the world has one, but a defense, and it's so funny because J.K. Jr., when he graduated from college said, do I become an entertainer or a lawyer? So funny, there's often a fine line between a good acting and a good defense. So where did you go to come up with that compelling speech for that particular character? I listened to what the director told me. Seriously, he gave me great, Gavoski gave me great notes on sort of like the psychology, you know, and then of course stuff in the script is like, I, I love Yorgi's monologue, and that and I relate more to that guy, and still like four or five shows into this, I love watching that, and I feel, I don't know if it's because that's like that old guard that I grew up with, those were the people that when I was a kid were the adults, so to speak, so I still relate most to that. But to Garfinkelize myself, one of the things John said to me was, I, Garfinkel hates underachievers. <laughs> you know, and then it's in the script of like, she, it's, it's the game, it's not the players. And that sort of gives me the fuel to like, when I go out there and do that, I am looking to crush him. And it's getting that kind of psychology of like, using what he has said so passionately to his people against them, you know, because a lot of what I say in that is some of the things that he said. I throw it back in his face. And uh, it took me a little bit to, you know, I'm still getting it, but I, you know, it's a three and a half page monologue. You got, I, I think I had a clue, you know, but listening to, I wrote everything the director told me down over the period of the rehearsal. You know, over the weeks, and I and I got buttoned up to here, and uh, I still feel like I'll continue to try it on, but I think I got a grip now. John, does other people's money, the expression that we've been using for us, does that now buy productions into this or whatever in weeks? Um, does this have another significance for you now? Of the, the term "other people's money." <clears throat> Me, I'd like to turn it right now. Um, yeah, I think so. I think that you know it's um, it's it's a you know, and I've always felt this for a long, long time that the people who manipulate money live in a different world than we do. Um, they just and they play by separate rules, which I think you know, Bernie Sanders. That was the main key point of his campaign was that people are playing by other rules, and they're playing with other people's money, and they're playing with a tr tremendous advantage and edge. Uh, because they all communicate amongst themselves in their own little circle. And then whatever happens to get left over, we might take advantage of it, but not really. And no matter which way the economy blows, they never lose. Um, so yeah, you know, it's kind of, it has kind of been uh, very impactful. And a segue into that, John, is, is this revival, this version in the second um, decade of the 21st century, is this an indictment on society today, or is this just an evolution of society, just as much as the Industrial Revolution was 100 years ago, where people left the farm and came to the urban sector, and that changed society? So is this just the new normal, or is this an indictment on society? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I struggle, I, I really worked try hard to try to position the play to be done in this year, in this time, in, in, in this place, in this time, and, I, I, I don't remember the climate exactly back in the 1990s, and I, I wonder whether in 1990 we were on the edge of the sort of information revolution. Computers were just coming in, and the stock market is posi was positioned for a big, big rise in the 1990s. Um, 
And I wonder whether the play was heard differently then than it's heard now, because I now think the pendulum is sort of swinging back a little bit more closer to Georgie's argument that what do we do with the people who have left, who have been left behind? Both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are asking that question. What do we do with the people who have left, who have been left behind by a lot of what's happened financially in this country? So I wonder whether the, doing it now, the pendulum is swinging back, and I tried to take that into account in the, 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 the how the last moments of the play are realized in a kind of way. And I don't, I didn't see the play back in 1990, and I don't remember how it how it landed exactly, but I don't know, maybe somebody remembers, somebody who saw it, I don't know. But I did try to make it as much as I could speak to what's happening now, and I think there's still a tremendous amount of relevance in this 20-year-old play for what's happening now. Rosie, what advice do you have for female actors, or even male actors for that much? Here you are, a young woman, only a few years older than Andrea playing her mother when there are some actresses who would not accept a role like that? Well, Be because they're fighting aging, yeah. whatever you call it. <laughs> and you took it on, and you did it brilliant. I think, it would, number one, my advice for all actors is train. Train, number one. And number two, I think, is very important to let go of the judgment and the idea, the label of how I might look or how people might perceive me. If casting thinks you're good for a role, then embrace it. I mean, really, it's more fun. It's more fun for me when I play roles that people don't recognize me or that are way different from who I am. So I would say training and let go of the judgment, the idea that we think we have to look a certain way. You know, and we, we battle that every day as women, obviously, as Hispanics also. You know, sometimes we want to try to fit in, and, and yeah, I mean, fitting in is great, but there's room for everyone. <laughs> but being bilingual, being bicultural, and just if you embrace it, then the battle is less uphill. And before I open up to Q&A, I want to do a, a rapid fire with each of you. Just ask 30 seconds, a quick question. Your biggest influence as an actor? Oh, um, <laughs> the biggest influence no. as an actor? Could be a person, could be an actor, could be someone. My, um, gosh, I do, um, a couple people coming to mind. Well, James is here, so uh, James Price. <laughs> He's, uh, he is one of the founding members of the acting studio in the Chelsea Repertory Company, and I met with him and John Borowski 20 years ago. I had already graduated from college um, with a degree in theater and was already working professionally, but um, I just felt like I needed to train more. I felt like I wanted to be better. And um, I had never studied Meister technique and I wound up going through the program and it was one of the greatest things that I ever did for myself was to, to train with them under Meister. Um, and to this day, it still helps me. In fact, there was one, uh, one of our performances, Garfinkel and I, we went up on lines, completely, completely blank. <laughs> and then I just went to repetition. I just kept repeating my line. Yeah. <laughs> and then we were like, then we did a little improv back and forth, a little repetition, and then bam, we were back on the script. We're like, thank God. But it was like, it was the, it was the training, the miser training, be able to stay in the moment. You know, um, there's been plenty of flubs throughout all of our performances, and it's just being able to like pay attention, be in the moment, and pick up the ball, and improvise, and go. And um, after having had that experience with James and John uh, 20 years ago, I, I, you know, even at that time, I said to myself, oh, I wish this was the first thing that I did acting-wise. I wish this was my base. I think I would have been better. It would be better to have Meisner as a foundation for acting and then study whatever else from there. But either way, it worked out. <laughs> it seems to be working out. <laughs> but, uh, so for sure, James, I mean, I'm still, obviously, you can see 20 years later, still I'm here. still in Full touch circle. with him. Yes, yeah. That's yes. nice. For sure. Bruce, your biggest mentor as an actor? Uh, well, there's been a lot of uh, influences. I, I, I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse and studied with Sandy Meisner there and, um, and studied uh, as a teacher with him and with James. And, uh, uh, you know, the... the thing about acting is really doing it 
Um, you just have to do it and do it and do it and do it. It's the only way that it, it but what you I'm start to live. Who validated you? Who made uh, you? Uh, you? Uh, I validated myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it took a long time, a really, really long time. Um, uh, and you, in the end, you know, we're the only ones living our lives. And I'm the only one who's on stage acting in my skin. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what it is. And, uh, you know, we only get one shot at this whole thing, so. Uh. One more thing with James. All right, so uh, this is my first time producing. And uh, opening night, I, I guess uh, that day I was texting and sending emails back and forth about seating and reservations. And then, and then I got an email from James saying, hey, no, you are not allowed to receive any more emails. You're an actor and you are oh, have a performance tonight. No more. Get, stop doing it. You're not in producer capacity anymore. I'm like, oh, okay, got it. But that was like a t-shirt talking to a student in the sense that I totally loved that he did that and reminded me. I was like, yes, okay, I'm like, put my acting hat on, right, producing exactly. thing along. Yeah. <laughs> Marco, your favorite thing that you've ever performed in? Um, I think it's, um, I remember being in Rockland Community College and one of the first plays I was in was the front page and that might have been the favorite kind of like because I, you know, so it was your first, you know, that it, it was the excitement of being in, it was like, there was like 25 people in the production. I don't know if the show was even any good. But I definitely have a, a sweet spot always for that because it was um, the first time I was really in a play. So it has to be that one. Rosie, your most memorable role in a theatrical play? I love The Butterfly. Um, the Dominican play? It, yes, it, it's, this, it's the story of uh, three sisters who initiated a chapter called the June uh, 14th chapter. And it was the, re the group of revolutionaries who fought to uh, take down uh, the dictator of the Dominican Republic. It started by, it was began by these women. And a wonderful writer, Julia Alvarez, who's Dominican, wrote a, a novel, a prize winning novel. And yes. Wow. Nobody brought an acting. <laughs> <laughs> no one. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Andrea, what, um, what brought you to cope with this case? Um, and I kind of did it to you? Did you find this play? No. How did it come um, about? Well, you know, you know, me being on Jane the Virgin and being at, you know, getting to this level, you know, you're always trying to, the, 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 you know, are like, we gotta get you that, we gotta get you that feature, we gotta get you the feature in that, and during the hiatus. And that sounded great, because you know you want to build upon that and you want your career to continue and all that. Um, and I had gone out on a few auditions, and this was like maybe November, December. But I was feeling this pressure to like get something, to, to book a, a job, like a feature, and, and then on some level it would validate me, um, and it would you know mean I was good enough or something. And but there weren't a lot of opportunities coming my way, and I. I felt uh, like I was in this weak position. I didn't like where, where I was. I, I didn't like the feeling of waiting for someone to hand me a job. I mean, I've sort of been in that position most of my life, but still, it was like, you know, I felt like I was gonna be a failure if I didn't book a film. And I just did not like that. And I had been wanting to produce a, a play for a few years. And there was one night in January or February, I don't remember exactly, that I went to go to bed and I just didn't like that feeling of being passive and weak and being, you know, not in control. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> Most actors are not in control. <laughs> and um, I said, fuck, man, I don't like this. I don't like this feeling. No, 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 I'm gonna do something. And what do I wanna do? What do I wanna do as an actor? I wanna work on stage. I need that. I need to feed my creative soul. That's what I need and no one's gonna give it to me. I'm gonna give it to myself. I'm gonna do a play. I'm gonna produce a play. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna wait for somebody to hand me a freaking film role and now all of a sudden I'm validated and important. Bullshit, you know? <laughs> and so I, I reached out to James and John for uh, 
play recommendations. I didn't even occur to me. I was just like, hey guys, um, I want to do a play. I'm going to produce a play. Do you have any plays in mind that you think I might be good for? And then James responded back with, uh, yeah, yeah, we can help you with that, but who are you producing this with? Do you, do you want to work with us? And I was like, yes, I want to work with you because I so love John's direction. I've been in plays with him before and I love James. And it just made complete sense. So because for me, coming here to this theater and working with them and then it being in New York is like going home. And I've technically been away from home for two years once I booked Jane. Uh, it's been, you know, I've been, I've come back to New York, but I'm, I'm away. I'm away most of the time. It's hard. Um, so this felt good to me. This felt right to work with them. Um, so it was really just from a feeling of I want to take control. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about the Fresh Air Fund. Okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> do you have you guys heard that I was trying to, or I still am, raising money for the Fresh Air Fund? Um, it's a charity that um, supports inner city kids of a low of low income level and sends them to summer camp up in the Caskill Mountains and they and or this is another thing people don't know is that they'll be sent to host families. So so families that are, are well to do families will take these kids in for the summer and give them like the time of their lives. So when I was uh, twelve years old I wound up getting a chance to go to the Fresh Air Fund. I had never been to camp, summer camp before. Um, and I got to go for two weeks in the Catskill Mountains, but it was an amazing experience and I've never forgotten it. And over the years, I have contributed to them just private, like as a private donor. Um, and then with the opportunity that Jane has given me, um, you know, I, 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 I've been able to raise more money. So I have like corporate sponsorship that's doing matching funding um, for my Indiegogo campaign. And uh, so, so yeah, so, so far at least 5,000 is going to the Fresh Air Fund at this point in time. Um, you work in the time. And um, so it's, it's an Indiegogo campaign. If you'll follow me on either Twitter or, or Instagram, you'll, you'll find, or even Facebook with the Acting Studio or my Facebook if, you're, if you follow me, um, you'll find the information on Indiegogo. It's, I, I can't give the name, no, no, so you know, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, Indiegogo. Look for the Fresh Air Fund, Andrea Navera, and you'll find yeah. it. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks um, for asking. <laughs> Do you want before breaking down? I have just a quick question. So uh, the dresses you wore were those beautiful colors. Was that, I found that, and you should feel very empowered out of this whole thing, because you came out feeling, I, I thought, very strong. Was that intentional, those strong, solid colors? Yes, it was of our director's choice, actually. I think that was his, his envision <laughs> of the choices of color. And we were very specific, too, about the progression of color. Mm -hmm. um, the most important being we wanted red for the first time she meets Garfinkel. Um, it's just a, a woman, it's, it's sex, but it's also power, right. um, that color. So that was what that was about. Um, and then we eventually ended up with green, the color of money. Uh, so yes. I thought it was an Irish show. Well, it could be that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a double meaning. I'm not sure how much I was reading into the color. Right, well that's good. But I agree, it was also the intensity of the yeah, colors. It, was, it wasn't just yeah. the shade of green or the yeah. shade of red. It was like great, intense. Intense. It, they, yes. They blew up. It helped me to get in touch with that power that I was trying to, mm -hmm. that ambition that I was trying to achieve through the character. It worked. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> How long was your rehearsal period, and how did that come play out? How did that work? A week. We did it in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we amazing? <laughs> Um, it was a six week, six week period. We would have, no, actually it was five weeks. We would have had six weeks, but we had a delay with casting. It was, it was a challenge to, to cast. Um, well, we had Bruce already, so it was a challenge to cast uh, Rosie uh, B and Garfinkel, because John, as soon as he walked in, we were like, oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so we're like, okay, Bruce. I mean, um, Yorgi check, Cole's check. And it was those two that was hard <laughs> because Garfinkel is very specific, as you can yeah. see. It's, it's not anyone can just play that role, um, and Marco's done a great job. And then Rosie, I, I specifically wanted a Latina woman to play my mother. Thank you. At, at the very least, <laughs> at the very least, I, I, I would have liked to have you know cast more Latinos, but at least you know I could do I could do my mom. Um, and speaking of that, I have a Latino designer. His name is Raul Abrego, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
Uh, we have a uh, Latina, costume two Latina design. Co costume designer, uh, assist two assistant directors. So that was important to me to to have to have that. This is the showcase contract, is that right? Yes, we were rehearsing in the days or evenings and fifty rounds. We rehearsed schedules. that for Mary so. Yeah, we were we were actually we had a great rehearsal schedule. It was just we were fortunate that all of us were available during the day and even <laughs> evenings. We, we had like it was just perfect. It, it worked out wonderfully. No problems with rehearsals. And I have to say, even though it was a lot of hours, we had a smooth process. Yeah, I felt like we were, you know, in a groove and we worked. That's nicely. because and John was, was yeah. very organized. Our director was very, very organized. So that's why we had such a good time. I would like for you to like say your opinion. How do you, um, for Hispanic women, how do you see them in the industry in terms of opportunities? And especially if you have an accent, what, what's your advice? Oh, that's a question for her. <laughs> yeah, I um well as an acting and diction coach for accent production, I don't necessarily advocate for losing your accent, but you must get to a point where you are intelligible, have good diction, so you have to always work on your training. Embrace that. Embrace the Latino. Don't try to lighten your hair, don't try to get, you know, blue eyes and fit in, look like everyone else, so embrace that, of course the training, but um, work on your diction. You know, the accent, if you can, you can do accent reduction, but you don't have to think that you've got to book the job, you cannot have the accent. I mean, we have beautiful it's examples beautiful. of that. Oh. Raul Julia, we have Maria Conchita Alonso. Maria Conchita Alonso, I mean, we have a lot of very successful actors that um, didn't really get rid of the accent, and I really believe that you don't have to. The woman, must train. the woman who plays my mother on Jane the Virgin, do you know, do you know her? She, yeah, yeah you want quote. She, um, she's very uh, theater trained. Like she studied for so long, many years, and she even did Broadway and everything. Long, very fruitful career. Very fruitful Wonderful theater life. career. Mm -hmm. Um, before she, you know, was working. Uh, oh, she's always working. She's always been working. She's one of those actors that you know you don't know who they are, but they work all the time. They work more than the like leads do. <laughs> so, um, but I remember she talks quite often about how she worked so hard on her accent, not to get rid of it, but to be understood. I remember that about her, and she's very, very particular about, and then she would joke around about how she used to say things. She, she would talk about her young self, how she used to pronounce it. So um, yeah, I would emphasize the working on your kitchen. I still need it too, I hear myself, I'm like, <laughs> Anecdotes behind the scenes. So, did you like donuts before? Do you like them any less? <laughs> <laughs> I am having a very interesting relationship with donuts. <laughs> <laughs> you really start to pick it. You have to eat that many donuts, you start to pick and choose your flavors. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still enjoying them. It's becoming a kind of store of donuts. Since right? Friday night, I've been craving donuts. <laughs> Help yourself. There's all kinds of pieces of donuts all over. <laughs> We talked about this about uh, about smoking. I said, you know, I was a smoker for years until I had to do a play in which I had to smoke nonstop, and then I was like, what? Then you realize, okay, maybe it's time to reconsider. <laughs> and and as in, in the audience on Friday, there was one scene where literally in seconds you went through that door yes. in one dress, and you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it like it almost seemed like less than thirty seconds. Yeah, and yeah. You were in a tight fitting. Yeah. Completely different outfit. I, I was like, how does she do that? You didn't look disheveled at all. You look at how did she do that? Don't fucking end Let me tell you one thing. You don't want to be in that hallway when she's looking at you. No, they all go like this. They go like this. Oh, that's funny. No, the funny thing is today, I don't know if anyone would notice this. You don't know the play, but John, I don't know if you know this. I did, yes. So what happened? The director always knows. So what happened was, I when I go out that way, the after my first, um, I think it's my first scene with him. Yeah, my yes, first scene. Yeah, I I exit that way in the yellow dress, and I have to pick up the tender, the the newspaper with the tender, and it's on the shelf back there, and I'm supposed to grab it and run all the way around back. She helps me with my dress, and then I come on. 
So it's Rosie who's helping you? Right, no, 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 not with the dress, not with the dress. With the dress. No, no. Yes, no, no, I forgot, I'm in the red dress already, so I have to run around. But I, I get to this door back there, and I go, fuck, I forgot the newspaper, so I were running around <laughs> to go get it. And then I realized that the scene had ended, so then I decided, well, I'm going to scream from over there. I'm supposed to scream from over there, and I go, ah! And so you hear my voice, I'm like, ah! I don't know, was there a really long pause? I, <laughs> I don't know how you did it because I was like, I heard it from over there and I thought, holy fuck. <laughs> She's in the wrong place. Two seconds later, you know. And I saw her over there and I was like, I don't know how she did that, like ventriloquism or something. <laughs> I said, because I knew that my cue, so I said, well, at least if I use my voice, I'm there. You know? <laughs> I, I, it's just me, like, I have to be screaming anyway, so. <laughs> and then in the dressing room, Bruce says to me, what happened? What was all the yelling about? I said, I don't know. I think she's just venting earlier. <laughs> but it helped me, actually. I was like, I should almost keep that. I should scream over there. And then I over there. Because then the running, too, I had to run. Because normally I'm waiting in the wings, and then I scream, and then I come on. But the running helped to inform, like, my... Like my my, I must have had to get in a fucking cab, motherfucker, with fucking tenders, and show up and get through the building and everything. So it helps me. I don't know. <laughs> so my last question is: This is a comedy drama, and it was very funny in certain parts and very serious in other parts. And a, a little birdie once told me, comedy comes out of drama. So I wanted just to hear your thoughts on this play in particular, comedy, drama, philosophy, how you juggle the two, separate in times, merge it, just your thoughts on comedy, drama, and your experience. I don't think, uh, from, I've worked with John a couple of times now, and, uh, um, and he never really, he only directs the truth, you know, he directs, he, you find the, hum, the path of, Humanity through it, and if it's humor. if it's woven through the fabric of the material, then it'll be funny. When if it's true, it'll be funny, and you know you can't, you can't step on that that oh this should be a funny moment, so we're really gonna you know pound it. You just you 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 listen and you're truthful, and uh, and it finds its way. The audience hears it. Um, but we we came out uh, Friday night, and that was our fr full house, and. It, uh, all of a sudden, people are laughing. And it's like, oh, right, we're, yeah, we're in the comedy, too, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's... I experienced the comedy more today than I have before. I think it's because I kind of relaxed a little bit. Because when you wic Wikipedia the play, it immediately in the first line, it says a comedy drama. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it's up front center to, all, to you in this play, but that's the way it seems. And having experienced it Friday was yes, you get this both worlds. Mm -hmm. For sure, I think it's when the when the actors are so invested in the reality and the truth of what's happening, the seriousness of it is it's where fine. the comedy comes out because it's in the writing. Um, when you're so invested in your part, your argument, whatever your point of view, the, the, the humor comes out. Although I think on some level, and maybe you guys, I don't know if you agree with me. You have to have a sense of where the humor is anyway, and kind of there is a sense, at least for me, where you play with it a little bit to go for the humor. Don't well, there's some, that, there's some humor that is written, as you say, in the play. If, if you weren't getting the laughs on the sexual connotations in the play, mm -hmm. then it would really fall flat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would just be like, ooh. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the intentional, or the almost the unintentional, ironic comedy that comes in, you know, my character says, don't look at me like that. You know, you're going to get a reaction. It's a laugh. Yeah. You're going to get a reaction cool. from that. Um, and so, so, but it's ironic in a way. It's more, it's a little darker. Um, so yeah, you're, you're going to get those moments. But you have to, as everyone says, one, well, you have to sort of play it straight and let what the author did carry it there. Yeah, it's so beautifully written. I mean, I think that you don't have to really work the lines. Um, that uh, that that's what's beautiful about this play. I find that he's the yes, it's complicated. We talk about jargon, and we have all this Wall Street and you know number talk, but it's not pretentious. It's not pretentious at all. I don't I don't find it. And 
when it's just real, yes, you have the ha-ha funny, but then you have the ironic funny. And um, I found it funny from the get-go. It's just like all the sexual stuff. It's the undercurrent. You don't talk about, and, and Garfinkel and I talk about this a little bit, the sexual parts with Kate, where he says, come to me, you belong with me, all that. You know, which there's a, there's a side of it that's kind of the sexual harassment, but there's the other side, it's the declaration of love. You and I are the same, that chemistry that's born between them, that it's not about the words, and it's all the undercurrent. So I think the humor and the sex, that you know, the sexiness of it and the humor is there. I, I love that, that he achieved all of it, you know, just up and down, um, in and out, yeah. And those lines in particular, I remember Marco, Marco Greco playing Garfinkel when he said, I don't need it, but that's why I do it. Um, or when you came out and said, let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. And I forgot what you said, let's make a deal, baby, or let's make a deal. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> can I admit? I'm going to tell you the truth about that moment. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, maybe not. <laughs> no, 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 no. Finish that thought. In that moment, uh -huh. that was not in the script. Because <laughs> that was Friday. You that was wasn't right. there today? Was that not in today? Because on Friday, no. Friday it was let's make a deal. Baby, but no, no, because what happened was that was that Pfizer <laughs> moment when we went up on the line. And we, then we were having so much fun and all of a sudden world. hearing the play that here yeah. we were in a scene that all of a sudden the scene was like full of laughter. And then when we got to just sit down and have the to take part. care of the business part of it, we were both having way too much fun. <laughs> But it was, so, but that, so I'd rather be having too much fun. So then that was the improv part of it because if you, so so really what that moment was about making a deal. And, and I understood that, that's just, this is why I said that. Because I was like, all right, could, could we stop fucking joking around and make a deal already? That was like, come on, let's get this. And so I was trying to get us as the character and as the actor to get back on script. So that's what, what I was. struck me then was this Irish New England girl meets the Bronx. Okay. Well, in the yeah. manner that you put it, let's make a deal, so let's make a deal, baby. Baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the Bronx of me coming out, though. So. <laughs> um, so the two of you did not know the script before? No. I, this script, did you know it prior? How no, it I only knew the marquee. I remember when this was playing at the Manila Lane Theater. I'm in wow. uh, I, 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 I want to say Dan Loria was in it. I don't know who, I know there was a lot of actors who played it, but I wanted to go see it and I didn't go see it. Mm -hmm. But I remember that a long time. The movie, I know I've seen the movie. Like, well, were you I know surprised that you get the girl? I was surprised that you get the girl. Well, the ending of the movie is different. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Yep, they oh. changed the ending of the movie. I was surprised when I read the script. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was hoping you'd get the girl like, the movie for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Andrea Navedo, Bill Herman, Bruce Herman, I'm sorry, Bruce Herman, Marco Greco, Rosa Berredo, and John O'Hearn. Thank you. Thank you.